thank you all for excellent presentations. We now have about 30 minutes uh, for uh, Q&A. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, I want to remind our audience that they can ask questions in the Q&A button or using the Q&A button. They can ask questions in the chat uh, section or by, uh, by raising their hand. Um, before I start reading the questions in the Q&A section, I uh, just want to make a brief comment about the support for the civil society uh, that uh, I think was suggested by several, uh, by at least Larry and, and Sarah. Um, I want to say that as a president of an NGO myself, of course, I would welcome uh, support for NGOs and civil society in Tunisia. But I must also say that I've been very, very disappointed in the role that civil society played uh, in Tunisia uh, since the coup. Um, uh, they've been either silent, completely silent, uh, I guess because they are worried and afraid that they'll be uh, persecuted or shut down or something like that. And in some cases, they've been supportive of the coup, uh, which is really shocking that many organizations that have received millions of dollars from the US and the EU in the past years to support democracy and defend democracy have come out in support of the coup uh, in the weeks and months after, after uh, July 25. So I think we really need to be careful about uh, supporting uh, civil society and which civil society organizations we support. And, um, and I think in this particular time, I don't think that civil society um, has the strength really to, to, to stand up to, uh, to Qais Saeed because they are uh, afraid and genuinely afraid. I have many, many fr friends in, in several NGOs in Tunis who, who are telling me that, you know, that they are afraid that they'll be uh, arrested or shut down, you know, completely if they speak up uh, against the coup. So I think we have to be realistic in, in terms of what civil society really can do. But my other comment and, and, and really a question that I ask to all of you is on the role of the military, which to me is really has been what's disappointing about all of this. The Tunisian military historically has always stayed out of politics, uh, historically from independence from 1956 up until this coup in 2011. This is what was really uh, surprising and shocking that they, they uh, uh, followed uh, Qais Saeed's order to shut down the parliament. Uh, until the, today, there are two tanks in front of the, of the parliament shutting down the parliament. And, and uh, in addition to military courts uh, trying um, several members of parliament and several opposition leaders, several lawyers, and several uh, just uh, you know, bloggers and journalists being tried by military courts. So my question to all of you, and maybe Sharan, because I think you've been focusing a lot on the military uh, role in Tunisia and the cooperation between the US and Tunisian military, is why can't we have more leverage on the military? You know, Why can't we make it clear to them that if they want to be allies with the United States, and by the way, I do think that the Tunisian military cares deeply about its relationship with the, with the US military, Unlike Qais Saeed, who perhaps doesn't, does not care that much. But uh, why can't we explain to them that uh, what they are doing is, is uh, illegal, is unconstitutional, and that if they expect the, their uh, special relationship and special non-NATO uh, uh, member uh, strategic ally status to continue, that they have to uh, revert to staying neutral in, in political matters. Sharan, do you have an answer to that question, or maybe Sarah also? Just a, a couple of thoughts, if I may, on the role of the Tunisian military. I, I agree with you that uh, the actions they have taken over the last year suggest that, yes, they do support the coup. The, agree, the agreement to follow that order to close the parliament suggests that, yes, uh, they are supportive of the coup. On the one hand, they could say that, hey, we're just following orders. In that sense, we're still neutral or apolitical. But uh, the order itself was unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
professionalism dictates that you refuse an unconstitutional order. And we should mention that the Tunisian military has previously refused unconstitutional orders in the past, mm -hmm. uh, suggesting that if it didn't this time, that indicates some degree of support for uh, what has happened. Uh, and so I think uh, the US should exert more leverage over the Tunisian military to convince them that the way this is headed is not good for the Tunisian military. I think one thing that the US military is learning is that civilians politicizing the military, trying to get the military involved in supporting what the president is doing, hurts the military. It hurts trust in the military. It hurts uh, the military's public image. And I think if that message is sent uh, from a mill mill level, US military to Tunisian military, that could be quite effective. Likewise, I think uh, the US military DOD plays an important role for actually leveraging the military aid and convincing the Tunisian military don't continue supporting this coup uh, because we know we both value this military to military relationship relationship and the way to preserve that is uh, 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 letting the parliament, for instance, reopen. Um, if I may address two other points before we turn it over. Uh, sure. One is uh, this question about uh, the coup clause in the US. And I think we've already seen a little discussion in the chat. I think Larry picked up on this as well, uh, that although this is not a military coup, this is a presidential coup, self-coup, et cetera, uh, the, I think there's two ways uh, to respond. One is that the coup clause itself has changed a bit over time. Uh, Alexis Arieff, who I think is on, uh, is one of the panelists, uh, has recently written uh, about how it did get updated from previously being narrowly about military coups to now uh, being about uh, uh, coups generally or decrees. Uh, in which the military plays a role. They certainly did in this case, but yes, it is uh, not against the president. It is in favor of the president. But the point here I want to make uh, is that that is also an important signal to send moving forward, that presidential coups also uh, result in aid suspensions, especially uh, since presidential coups are becoming more common over time, almost more common in the past two decades than military coups, more common in terms of democratic backsliding, it would be important to send that precedent uh, moving forward. The final point I want to make is, I think the most persuasive reason for not cutting aid or leveraging the IMF loan, which is the fear that other countries are going to jump in, whether it's the Gulf, Saudi, uh, UAE, or it's China, or it's Russia, that there is some fear that uh, letting Tunisia go is going to push them towards these other countries. Uh, and what we've seen over the past year is that Algeria stepped in a bit, providing 300 million loan to Tunisia. There's rumors that Saudi helped a bit as well. Uh, but otherwise, it's been peanuts from, uh, I mean, Tunisia is in crisis, they need money to, to you know, even to, to fund the budget, and yet these other countries have not stepped in yet. And so I find it unlikely that they will step in more if the U.S. were to start to put a bit more pressure. The other thing I would say is that let that additional funding come. I mean, Tunisia needs it. Tunisians need uh, that funding wherever it comes from. I don't think it's going to give those countries leverage over the Tunisian government. It's not as if our funding to them is really giving us any leverage over Kais Saeed's actions. Uh, and so I, I would, uh, I think, downplay this fear that other countries are going to step in uh, and to say that we should use this leverage that we have, having built it up for, uh, for a decade or more uh, in Tunisia. Thank you. Sarah? Sure. Um, I don't really have too much to add on the military coup question. I think, it, it, I think Sean makes a really good point that, you know, if we were to call this a coup and start to set that precedent that you'll self coups, presidential coups can also trigger um, aid suspensions. I think that's a great idea. I mean, I tend to sort of think it's too late or a little bit that this should have been done, as Larry said, you know, early on. Um, and also we need to figure out, you know, what point did it become a coup? What point do we decide? And maybe that is after the referendum if, if things change. Um, but, you know, sort of, I, I wanna respond a little bit to um, 
some of the other points that were made. And I think, you know, as I said, I agree that the IMF should be used. It's already being used. The US has been using the IMF as leverage since day one of the IMF talks. They've been, you know, if you talk to the folks who are in the room in those discussions, they will tell you they've been putting that forward and it has not worked. So I, while I think it's, we still should keep, the IMF is a huge piece of leverage. Blinken mentioned it in his April 28th testimony. I think it's a good idea. I also don't think it's sufficient for us to pressure Saeed. And so I, I, I would love to hear from the folks um, in this call of how, how do you see this playing out? I guess, you know, maybe I'm being too, I don't know, maybe trying to, to do carrots is not a good idea. Um, I agree with how Larry characterized it. Do, do the, still push. The idea of the carrots is not that you only are nice to Saeed. The idea is that you're trying to push him in a way, you know, that's different from what we've been doing so far that has absolutely failed to get him to do something else that also helps the Tunisian people. And so I guess the question, um, and I, I'm maybe not supposed to be asking questions, but I think that the the question is, you know, so say, say we cut all our aid, say we say call off the IMF talks, IMF's not giving any money. What happens? In my mind, what happens is Tunisians literally starve because you have this massive food crisis that's being exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. You have people who are angry or all the factors that led to Saeed being able to take over power on July 25th get much worse, not to mention the factors that led to the revolution that were never addressed in the past 10 years. I don't see how any of those factors leads us to a more stable and democratic Tunisia or leads us to good results for the Tunisian people. And so I guess I'm curious of, of how all these punitive measures get us there. I just, I, I'm at this point, I'm very jaded where I be, just don't believe Saeed is going to sit down. I think the only way you get rid of him is through potentially a presidential election when his term ends. Maybe he won't even allow for that. But if you do, as Larry said, create the conditions that he is willing to actually take on, roll back some of these, prevent this constitution from being a complete, you know, authoritarianization of Tunisia, ensure that there are some escape hatches in that constitution to allow at least some modicum of democracy to happen over the next couple months, have a parliament come in, have him hold his elections when he actually has to hold the elections and get someone else by time to actually get a new government in Tunisia. Maybe that happens. I don't know. I'm, I'm just at a total loss of how do you, what, what is that exit ramp? How do you actually move things forward without really hurting the Tunisian people in the long run or in the in the short run, I should say. What about our message to the military, uh, Sarah? What do you think the message uh, should be? I mean, I agree with Sean. I think that the message should be that, you know, if you are a US partner, you have to abide by certain things. But again, being very sort of jaded at this point, we have very close relationships with a lot of really, really terrible militaries. Um, and I'm not sure what pressure we're sort of willing to use at this point. And I think that, you know, we do have the Leahy laws that, you know, if there are human rights violations that are done by a military that we fund that can trigger also cuts to assistance. So that's why, I mean, I, I really think just in general, rejiggering our, taking this moment and maybe it's too late, we only have two months, but taking this moment to say, we can't just keep business as usual. We can't just keep funding the same groups and people the same way that we've been funding them. So it's not benefiting Tunisia and it's not benefiting the United States. We need to figure out a better way to do this, fund people that are actually acting in our interests. And that's how we, working with the military on some of these, pro we have a lot of experience in, in training, Aunt Sharon knows this space better than I do, but on security sector reform, trying to train the military not to use courts to try civilians, things like that. We could work with them, make that a condition of continuing assistance. Shadi, do you have something to say yeah. about this? <clears throat> Yeah, just just to put a sharper point on on some of this. Well, first of all, um, I have to disagree a bit with Sarah. We, we have not actually used the IMF lever up until this point. That's simply that's not accurate. Um, we have not um, suspended IMF talks, IMF negotiations. It's still been on the table. What we're talking about is suspending talks if certain conditions are met. So it's not as if we would just suspend them unilaterally without any further explanation, we would say that um, we will move in this direction of suspending talks unless certain, certain benchmarks and conditions are met um, relatively soon, whether that's in a month, two months, whatever it happens to be, we can get into specifics. And then if those conditions aren't met, then IMF talks will be completely suspended and that will include talks about talks and anything having to do with going forward on the IMF that has not been used up until this point. Um, and, and, and I would just also say like on military aid specifically, 
there there is in, in my view there there is no prospect of tunisia moving to russia or china our allies always come up with this as a way to basically um you know impress on our emotions that and to make us feel that we have to stick with them um through thick and thin it is very difficult to shift your allegiance militarily from the us to russia also let's be clear a declining power that's a bit of a joke militarily china also in my view a declining power um because it's an authoritarian regime and authoritarian regimes tend to be inherently unstable as we're seeing now with their covid restrictions um so i would just say that and there's also the fact that in the last 11 years we've given i think close to um the f- the full amount of our military assistance in tunisia is at hundreds of millions it's maybe getting close to a billion dollars so um there's also the prestige factor um in terms of the relationship with the the best military in the world if you're actually saying that the military might have to rely on russian support first of all i'm not really familiar with recent examples where that's happened it's very difficult to do because of the interoperability of weapon systems maintenance spare parts the equipment that we've been giving to tunisia can't run on russian or chinese support they'd have to completely reorient their geopolitical position and if you want to cast your lot with china and russia at this point good luck to you but i think that we shouldn't fall into this we have to call their bluff on this because they're using that threat to try to manipulate us Thank you Shadi. Larry, do you have something to add on this question of the military and the role of the military? Uh just briefly um w- what Shadi said um resonates with me. Um uh I I had a similar reaction the idea that Tunisia is going to turn to Russia militarily. It's just I mean Russia is is so overextended now. and the russian military is in such a state of uh stress and disarray that um if it would have been plausible it doesn't seem very plausible right now i do think you know a lot of this um i i i realize there's anyone who's been been in government knows there's there is so much truth in the old adage that the devil is in the details and what looks clear and um compelling from the outside may be less obvious or more complicated when you peel away a lot of layers and, and get to the underlying reality I, i think this is part of what sarah was trying to say and um so um i also uh you know i know what i don't know <laughs> and i i don't know what the tunisian military is thinking um or what they believe but i know from other cases that um that two things are true and um that they the two things push in 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 terms of the recommendations for the moment in opposite directions and how we reconcile these two things is part of both the pain and the art of foreign policy one thing that is true is that um when the military has the integration and the kind of psychological and geopolitical orientation toward partnership with training by supply from the united states we have a lot of leverage that was shadi's point and um you know we don't want to underutilize our leverage but the other thing that's true is that when the boom is lowered in a decisive way and all of this training uh and integration is severed uh it can it can take it it sets in train a new set of dynamics uh and it can take a long time to recover so i i think this requires just a very very careful uh weighing of of um of costs and benefits of our strengths and vulnerabilities and and reciprocally with the tunisian military 
But one thing that's clear to me is like, as I said, we should be trying to separate Saeed from the Tunisian people. We should also be trying to separate him from the Tunisian military and making clear to the military that the more they act as a professional military and not an enforcer of an illegal seizure of power, the more the relationship they value with the United States militarily can be preserved. Thank you very much. Um, now we have 10, actually 11 questions in the Q&A section. I'm going to read them very quickly all together. And you as panelists can pick and choose which answers, uh, I mean, which questions uh, you want to answer, because I don't think we have a lot of time to answer all of them. But you can pick one or two or three questions that you want to answer. So uh, former Ambassador Herman Cohen, a retired ambassador, asks, when the Islamic Brotherhood is in power, are they able to engage in classic governance, or are they totally devoted to the Islamization of institutions? He has a second question. Has corruption arrived along with the authoritarian rule? Uh, so the problem of corruption, I don't think we talked about a lot today, but um, where do we stand on that? So John Hirsch uh, from the uh, Dawn organization, Democracy in the Arab World Now, says the suggestion of inviting Saeed to participate in the Summit for Democracy follow-on activities or to have him visit the White House while also acknowledge, acknowledging that he staged a coup is baffling. What is the lesson? Have a coup and you get to meet with the president? And the military played a significant role in this coup by blocking parliament and disclosure and through the continued military trials. It is helping to implement the coup and to call it merely a self-coup is inaccurate. Uh, Mr. Mohammed Bia Hamami uh, uh, asks, the incentivization approach assumes that Saeed is a hyper-rational actor who responds to incentives and disincentives in the classical utilitarian way. Aside from the rumors of neurodivergence, how do you think Saeed, Saeed uh, has responded to internal or external incentives or disincentives so far. Uh, Mohammed Shannawi, journalist with Voice of America, asks, with the full engagement in the war in Ukraine, would the US or the EU pay any attention to Tunisia, let alone take any action? Uh, question from Sabina Hennenberg uh, to Sarah. Those carrots you are suggesting make a lot of sense. Is it possible to implement them quickly enough to get Saeed, Saeed to reverse course on the referendum? Is that what you are suggesting? Uh, I may have misunderstood. Um, okay, Mr. Herman Cohen uh, also adds that Mugabe in Zimbabwe lost the constitutional referendum in 1998. That led to total dictatorship uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. Marco Stella asks, thanks to all the panelists for their insights, extremely enlightening. However, it seems to me there is very little possibility to twist Qais Saeed's arm via economic sanctions or aid cutting. On the contrary, the risk would be to further exasperate an already dire economic situation, which could bring the country towards social unrest and instability. And who, would benefit, and who would benefit from social unrests? Definitely not democracy. I would add who would benefit from social uh, rest? Definitely also not democracy. <laughs> it, would be, it would be dictatorship if, uh, if, uh, if there is um, no social or, or, or um, you know, popular unrest and upheavals against dictatorship. Uh, Herman Cohen says Ben Ali had, mi had military support. Mohammed Shinnawi asks again, how about the role of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE role in supporting the counter-revolution in Tunisia? And finally, um, Benjamin Dalton asks, uh, please see my question in the chat section. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the uh, chat section next. But uh, let's take your answers to these questions. Uh, Sharan, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, let me take the questions about uh, the economic crisis in particular. So the other 
very persuasive argument against cutting aid or leveraging the IMF is that it might lead to social unrest, instability, and not to democracy long term. Yeah. Sarah's solution is very clever of shifting that aid directly to the people through CSOs, etc. Uh, that is one way to uh, to alleviate the grievances in the meantime. I think another route though, is that the aid can be reinstated in phases, uh, not all at once, but based on intermediate metrics, right? So for Saeed to actually start a dialogue with not just the labor unions, but also the political parties and other CSOs, uh, just having the dialogue can release some of the aid. Agreeing to something in that dialogue could be another intermediate step. And then actually implementing whatever roadmap they agreed upon could be a third step that ultimately leads to the full resumption of aid. So I think you can carry it out in these intermediate steps to alleviate some of the uh, economic impacts. The other point I would say is that the current conditions on the IMF loans, the ones that would require the uh, subsidy cuts and other structural economic reforms, those are going to ultimately produce uh, in the short term, the social unrest and the instability. Uh, and so I would say replace those economic demands with these political ones uh, would be the, the smarter term for, for the, the instability and the economic unrest. Good, thank you. Sarah? Sure, thanks. So I'll just respond quickly to um, the question about the bad, what I said was baffling. So the idea is that, you know, if Saeed unwinds the things that he has done, then you reward him. It's not preemptively reward and say, good job, you had a coup, you get to come to the White House. The idea is he's already done what he's done. Our goal, I believe, is to return Tunisia to democracy and to get him to prevent him from going further but also to unwind all the things he's already done. And so you offer explicit carrots for if you do X, you get Y. Um, and again, that, that's sort of the, the point there. And, and similar to Sabine's question about, um, you know, is it, do we have enough time? I don't know if we have enough time, but I don't think we should use that as an excuse not to do something. I think the idea at this point, the most explicit immediate need is to prevent this constitution from codifying a lot of the things Said has been doing. And so again, it's sort of a mixed carrot stick approach where you would say, you know, if you, you need to have an actual inclusive dialogue, you need to allow all political parties and all actors in Tunisia to participate in that dialogue process. Um, the same kinds of things that, you know, we want to get to the point where we're not having this constitution come out and then it's going to be too late to sort of enact this. So it's sort of a speed method, if you can, to try to get some of this stuff done. Thank you. Shadi? Yeah, so I think that, you know, Marco's question is really good. And this is also what I think Sarah was rightly getting at, because I think this is, for, the, for those of us who are pushing for, let's say, a more proactive approach, we have to be able to contend with the concern of the dire economic consequences and are we making it worse or are we making it better and so on. But I actually think there's more of a common ground here uh, between Sarah's approach and say Meyer Sharon's approach. And you know maybe this is worth just clarifying a little bit, uh, a little bit more explicitly. I um, mean, Sharon sort of got, got to this. It's not as if you unilaterally and permanently suspend something, then you're done. Um, the lever, the way you approach the lever can be modulated depending on the progress or lack of progress that you see. So if we do suspend IMF talks, there would have to be clear conditions through which they would be reinstated. So almost by definition, if you introduce sticks, the removal of those sticks are effectively carrots. There's no really such thing as an only sticks approach. I'm just a little bit more skeptical of like the additional sweeteners, but I think that there, there would be reward if Kai Saeed does return on a democratic path. And then you could reinstate portions of the aid accordingly. But this is why all of this has to be publicly outlined because I don't trust the US government to actually hold to any private promises it makes to a dictator. The US doesn't really do that well. That's why the media, American organizations, people like us, we have to know what the public conditions are. So that way 
we can go back to our colleagues and counterparts in the State Department and DOD and say, listen, here was the public announcement. Here were the benchmarks that you agreed to. Are you meeting them or are you not? Um, and that's why the public part of this, in my view, is, is so important. Before I ask Larry to, uh, to uh, give us his uh, uh, answers, I wanna add something here to the panel I think is very important. In my opinion, uh, if we learned anything from the last 10 months, it is that uh, Qais Sayed is not capable of changing his mind, is not capable of, of changing course. You know, he is like a train uh, that goes in only one direction and at, uh, at, the, at not a variable speed, at a constant speed, maybe accelerating speed. He has not shown in the last 10 months any willingness to change course under a lot of pressure, both internally and externally. Uh, so I think we really have to revise our approach and, and we, we really basically have to give up on the idea that Qais Sayed is going to change course. He is not going to change course. And therefore we need to find other solutions, but basically keep in mind that he's not going to change course. So what are we going to do about it? Um, uh, knowing that he's not going to change course. Larry? Um, well, your statement, uh, Radwan, uh, is a partial response to one of the questions that was asked basically about whether Kai Said is a rational actor. And you're suggesting he's not. Um, mm -hmm. And so was the questioner, by the way, suggesting that. And I think that is actually one of the most interesting hypotheses that has been articulated here, that he's you know, mentally not a completely well individual, uh, to just put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. which is not unusual for authoritarian actors. If so, I'm not comparing Saeed, obviously, to Saddam Hussein, but if Saddam had been a rational actor, he would still be in power. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, there is a kind of messianic and megalomaniacal quality to many authoritarian leaders that put them beyond the practical manipulation of carrots and sticks in terms of moving them to where we want to get them to go. And my answer to this is he's not Saddam Hussein um, in, in a different sense that is more relevant to our discussion at the moment. He doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the full command of the system. He hasn't even come close to consolidating power in the way that an Assad or a Saddam or so on, or a Sisi now has done. And so um, I think we need very broad engagement with other power actors in Tunisian society. Uh, and then again, this is part of what I call the art and the pain of private diplomacy, uh, that we need to engage with a lot of other potential um, power actors in the military, in different levels of administration, to let them know what um, lies ahead if Tunisia goes in one direction rather than another. You know, I was tempted to say uh, that um, the situation could be portrayed to the Tunisian military uh, in such a way that could lead to a different uh, course of history for Tunisia. And I'll just leave it uh, at that. Um, I want to answer a couple of questions that are in the chat. Um, uh, and then this will bring me to a re final response to a couple other questions that haven't been addressed. My colleague at, at Stanford, Nate Grubman, asks, well, the IMF loan, Tunisia is really over a barrel now. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. So this IMF decision is gonna have to be made soon. And we won't know whether Tunisia is really sincerely headed on a path of return to democracy until much beyond um, when an IMF decision uh, would need to be made. Sarah might be able to clarify this, but I think it's possible for the IMF to make a bridge loan 
that would be a temporary reprieve from default or disaster without putting in the real structural funds. That is, I think the moment of truth could be uh, postponed um, while his intentions are tested. And then the point in the chat that Benjamin Dalton made is similar to a, a question uh, that was posed um, by Mohammed El Shanawi about the other actors in the region, uh, obviously in particular Saudi Arabia and UAE, and whether um, you know how they they fit into this since they have uh, worked so. Uh, assiduously to try and first um, preempt and undermine the success of um, Arab Spring uh, political changes, and then, uh, you know, probably to help encourage the rolling back of it in Tunisia. A and the sad reality is that, you know, none of these other power actors, UAE, Tunisia, uh, 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 UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt are going to be uh, the least bit helpful. And let's not have any illusions. Um, whatever leverage we have with Saudi Arabia now is going to be used to get it to pump more oil, uh, uh, to put onto oil markets, uh, given the crisis now with Russia's war on Ukraine. And there's not, not going to be any political leverage left over to try and get it to behave uh, more responsibly with regard to Tunisia, which it wouldn't do anyway. So, um, you know, we've just got to rally uh, other actors here. I wanted to respond finally to one last question that was posed, I think by Alex Sutton, um, also in the chat, which is this vision that, um, uh, uh, Kai Saeed has of a no party uh, democracy and whether that could be consistent with democracy. And I just want to say, um, both from philosophical and almost logical grounds, but also um, prior historical grounds, there is just no logical uh, reason to think and no historical evidence to suggest that banning political parties can produce anything resembling a meaningful democracy. You're already, you know, um, uh, precluding the principal instrument by which democratic competition is organized and fielded uh, and violating, I'd say, a, a basic uh, political right, which is the right to form political parties. Uh, and if you do that, uh, the evidence suggests that authoritarian manipulation always follows in its wake. Okay. Um, we are basically out of time, but let me see if there is any more urgent questions in the chat section. Um, Okay, you answered, Larry, a couple of questions already. Um, let's see. So a question from, um, from Monsef Zid. Um, the fail of democracy in the Arab world is supposed to be the responsibility of Western democracies as people are convinced that Arab governments are managed and supported by Western countries, uh, especially poor countries where governments are supported by US and European financial aids. Why uh, shouldn't democracy be a must for financial help for these countries? The reason I read this question is that this question, I think, is on the minds of a lot of people in Tunisia. You know, the US and European Union keep talking about promoting human rights and democracy, but yet we are supporting dictators all over the, all over the world, especially in the MENA region. And, uh, and people are really astonished. They, they see this as, as a contradiction. You know, you want to support democracy, but yet you're, you're justifying giving money uh, to to dictators, in this case, in this uh, case uh, to, to Qais Saeed, 
following a coup on democracy. You know, we're still justifying that, hey, we need to still give him money because, you know, for whatever reason, or give financial and military uh, uh, support. So a lot of Tunisians are saying, and the Arab world in general, or, or the MENA region in general, if you're supporting dictators, it means you're supporting dictatorships. You know, you can't be supporting dictators and uh, democracy at the same time. There is, there is clear uh, contradictions uh, that, that uh, you know, um, not even ambiguity, but really contradiction in supporting dictators, uh, especially after a coup, uh, and, and, say, and justifying the support and, and sometimes also in not calling it a coup, you know, that, you know, we don't want it a coup because we don't want to antagonize them, or I guess in the case of Tunisia, because it wasn't clear in the beginning that it was a coup. So why, why can't the US and the European Union uh, be more clear in their support of democracy, be, be more uh, assertive and, 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 and you know, they will gain so much credibility, you know, in Tunisia and in the, in the MENA region, in the Arab world, if we, say, if we take a different position that, look, if you do this, we are not going to support you anymore. It's, it's as simple as that. And I think we did that, at the, at the, by the way, at the end with Ben Ali. And that's why he fell at the end. You know, he lost all kinds of support from, from the US and the EU, uh, and, and uh, including from the Tunisian military at the end. And that's why he fell. But this ambiguity in our position, you know, that, yeah, we support democracy, but yet we are dealing with dictators uh, in a way that sends a, 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 a different message. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a, it might be a, a complicated question, but I, don't, I, I, I wonder if you have any uh, answer. People in, in Tunisia right now are struggling to understand really what is the position of the United States? What is the position of the European Union? why we condemn dictatorship, but we're still giving money to, to a dictatorship. Ruben, if I could jump, jump yes. in on, on this point. And I think it, it's really great that you brought this up because we're not really just talking about Tunisia here. Exactly. We're talking about an entire orientation in US foreign policy that's lasted decades. And this is why, look, we do what we do. We, tr we try to push the needle a little bit, but ultimately I'm pessimistic because to, for the U.S. to actually care about democracy in Tunisia, it gets at a, a much bigger strategic question. It's about the whole regional architecture in the Middle East. Our regional architecture as Americans has been designed around authoritarian regimes. This is not something you can change overnight. It's accumulated over time and we've kept on doubling down on this strategy. So we, I would hope that we can be better on Tunisia now, but it's a small part of a much bigger problem that in my view has to be addressed, that the, the US hasn't just been a bystander, it has not been neutral, it has been an active participant in sustaining authoritarian structures in most of the Middle East. I think we have to be very frank about that. And I think that the other answer to your question, Redwan, which I think is unfortunate, but, um, and these are people I talk to on a regular basis. I think many of them are, are well-meaning, but I actually think that many senior officials in the Biden administration, this is also true for the Obama administration years ago, I don't think they believe in democracy in the Middle East. And it's very hard for someone like me to come in and persuade them because it really comes down to a fundamentally different way of looking at global politics. And, you know, we try our best to make the case and to explain it. And I think there are positive voices in the administration who can perhaps bring the argument more effectively, but this is really what we're up against. It's about a whole way of doing business in the Middle East that has been bipartisan, that goes back many, many decades. And my hope is that for younger policymakers and and, and those who might play a role, uh, a bigger role in the future, they, they can't just tinker around the margins. They have to completely reconceptualize America's relationship with the Middle East. It's not easy, it's risky, but if we do want to support democracy, if we think democracy is the best thing for America's long-term interests, which I think it is, it may not be the best thing for our short-term interests. We might have to deal with some um, destabilization 
you can't have your cake and eat it. There are trade-offs in life just as there is in policy. But ultimately, there's a bigger question here that we have to think about more seriously. Thank you, Shadi. Any final closing uh, remarks from uh, the rest of the panel? Sharan? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I would just say two things quickly. One is that the US, to its credit, has been much better on this issue than Europe. I mean, partially suspending aid now, the public statements have been very critical relative to Europe, uh, which has been a bit slower, more concerned about refugees, more concerned about instability. Uh, yeah. And I think the message needs to be sent that what is going to cause instability, refugees, even security threats, is banning parties, moving to an authoritarian system that provides no ability to channel dissent through the system. That is the recipe for instability uh, and, and violence. Uh, the second point I want to say is your point earlier about is he a rational actor? I think what we have learned in the last 10 months is that there is one thing he cares about a lot, and that is this political project of creating a new republic. He doesn't care that much about the economy. He's delegating that to the prime minister, central bank governor, et cetera. But he does care about this consultation for a new constitution, a referendum that the Tunisian public doesn't care about, but he does. So that gives you an opportunity to find a way to uh, satisfy his cost benefit calculus as well as uh, support democracy, which is that we need to give him, as I said in the start, an off-ramp, a way that he still gets his new republic, a new constitution, but the process of creating that new constitution is one that's inclusive. All the parties are involved. In essence, the new constitution they create is the 2014 constitution with some improvements. Uh, for instance, removing the clause on the state of emergency that led to this whole crisis in the first place. But uh, Sharan, Sharan, his, his, his project uh, for the new republic is fun fundamentally at odds with the principles of democracy and with the, uh, you know, the values of democracy. He wants basically a Jamahiriya, you know, uh, like Gaddafi with, uh, I mean, it's a very different kind of system that he wants. How can you reconcile these two projects? Because he has already compromised on that by agreeing to parliamentary elections. The original system was local elections only, and they would send a delegate to the National Assembly. So that suggests that he is willing to compromise a bit on what that new system would look like uh, and potentially would allow for this win-win scenario where he comes out justifying to his base that, yes, I created a new republic, but all the other parties are also on board that this new republic is one that's going to be democratic. So that's what I'm hoping for, that through the maximum pressure that we're discussing that the U.S. could put could put that you'll get those initial dialogues now between Kais Saeed and the party, that you'll get that nice constitution that then gets passed in July. Thank you. Can I just that, say, I just wanted Sarah? to say, I want to disagree uh, with Shadi's point that the U.S. administration doesn't care about democracy in the Middle East. And I specifically don't think we can say that that's true about Tunisia. I don't think that was true in the Obama administration. Again, I was in on the inside in the years after the Arab Spring. The U.S. had almost no relationship with Tunisia prior to the Arab Spring. The amount of assistance, the amount of attention, it may not have been sufficient, but it dramatically increased. If we look at the U.S. approach since July 25th, over the past 10 months, again, certainly not sufficient. I've been very public about not about saying that. But I think what we saw was U.S. prior to July 25th, there was very little U.S. attention on Tunisia. What we have seen was the deputy national security advisor go over there. We saw multiple calls with the secretary of state. We saw the U.S. A lot of stuff also happening that we have not seen publicly. A lot of stuff privately where the U.S. has been very vocal. Again, the the rhetoric, the rhetorical stuff has not worked, but they've been very vocal about the fact that they care about democracy. We care about Tunisia because we care about democracy in Tunisia. And I think that it's to say that the people who are currently working on Tunisia and the administration do not care about democracy is just blatantly false. Okay, okay, but Sarah, look, I mean, what you precisely said, they're vocal. That's precisely the criticism. That is rhetoric. It is not content. It is not substantive. And I don't deny that they would prefer to have democracy, all other things being equal, but all other things aren't equal. Our officials 
um, will support democracy if there is no cost, if there is no risk to stability in scare quotes, then yes, they'll go along with it because there's no difficulty involved. But anytime something else is on the chopping board or it might affect some other narrow national security interest, democracy or political reform is always put on the cutting block. And don't even get me started on the Obama administration, which played a central role in the perpetuation of, of the authoritarian architecture in the Middle East. And we don't have to talk about the moral stain after the massacre in Egypt, but this is very dark stuff. And I don't think we can even, I think to say that um, the Obama administration cared about democracy in the Middle East after that initial in six months. I said in Tunisia. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but I was making a bigger argument about the entire regional architecture. It is impossible to say the US cares actually about democracy in the Middle East. If they did, we wouldn't have seen all the moral stains of the past 20 to 30, 40 years. I think we're opening a, a very, a much bigger um, uh, question and, and bigger topic for discussion that probably will be the subject of many, many other uh, seminars and webinars uh, to come. Larry, any final uh, comments, uh, ideas, uh, suggestions? I, I, I have only one, um, and because I know we really need to close. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank you and again, my fellow panelists. I, I just think, you know, even with the back and forth and the agreement and the nuances of agreement and disagreement, uh, it's, it's just been a tremendous exchange. Uh, I, I've really gained so much from it. And, and second of all, this is my final substantive point, and I hope it can be conveyed to the Biden administration, because this is obvious. Time is of the essence mm -hmm. um, in two respects. Number one, the economic situation and the um, impending possibility of a default or a complete economic collapse, but also the political situation. It's been said repeatedly, and I think it should be emphasized in conclusion that if he goes ahead and drafts a blatantly undemocratic constitution and then shoves it through in a blatantly undemocratic election, it'll be like concrete settling and it'll be very hard to reverse. So um, even though um, most of the, I mean, there's only so much diplomatic creativity and bandwidth in, in any uh, presidential administration in the US, and a lot of it's focused on Russia and Ukraine now, and the rest of it is focused right now on, um, on East Asia, the Pacific region, uh, the Quad, and the deterring of China. But I think uh, the one thing we can all agree on is, is that the next two months are absolutely critical, and we really need to press the Biden administration in partnership with the EU uh, to try to, um, ensure that uh, there is a democratic dialogue and hopefully more, more time and more inclusion for the process to go forward. Thank you, Larry. I really wanna echo Larry's comments that this has been a terrific panel, uh, definitely uh, one of the best panels we've had uh, in the last uh, year on this topic. Um, Thank you all very much for your uh, input, ideas, and suggestion. It's a, it's a difficult uh, topic, but I think we all agree that Tunisia should uh, get more attention uh, from the Biden administration, and that the next two months are going to be critical uh, in terms of uh, saving Tunisia and saving Tunisia's democracy. So I think that I hope that the Biden administration uh, is listening uh, to this panel and uh, to this advice, and uh, we will uh, uh, try to communicate to them some of the ideas and recommendations of, of this panel. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you all very, very much for joining us today. It's been a terrific uh, panel. And uh, thank you to all the panelists as well as all the participants for all your excellent questions. And sorry, we didn't have time to cover all the questions, but hopefully we'll have more discussions in the future. Thank you all very much and have a, an enjoyable uh, rest of the day. Thank Very you, Rodwan.
Thank, Thank you, Larry. You. Thank you, Sarah, Sharon, and Chadi.